Good afternoon or good evening, or actually good, I think it's morning, late morning in Australia. So depending mm -hmm. upon where you are, uh, this is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And it's always a treat to see Michael Robotham here with us, uh, albeit virtually, to discuss his brand new book, When You Are Mine. Got a copy right here. And um, let's see, what can I say, Barbara, the usual, my spiel. Um, if you have questions for Michael, as they, as they occur to you throughout the hour, go ahead and put them in the, in the comments or the chats feature. And Barbara will summon me back on, on screen and towards the end of the hour, I'll be happy to ask any of your questions. So Barbara, over to you. Thank you, Patrick. Michael, what a pleasure to see you. I've learned uh, from a little research I did today that you are joining us in what your children refer to as your cabana of cruelty. My I cabana, I used to, um... <laughs> My, in our previous house, I had uh, I had a basement office, which they referred to as Dad's Pit of Despair. And uh, in this new house, um, they had to give my office some name, and it's called the Cabana of Cruelty. I love it. So what more, more perfect place for us to have a discussion about a crime novel. Now, in order to bridge the gap between tomorrow in Australia at 11 in the morning and this afternoon in Scottsdale, 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I have with me a cup of tea, but Michael, in honor of you, my husband baked crumpets. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so there it is, my lowly, my lowly crumpet. I I'm not them. going to try Good to eat it on screen, but I thought the least I could do was try to get you know, into a suitably God, you British know, mood. Even though you're in Australia, you are still writing um, novels with a background in the UK. Hmm, that's true. I mean, I lived in the, I was born and bred in Australia, but I lived in the UK for 12 years. That's where my, I was a journalist there for, for, uh, for a long while, working for Fleet Street newspapers. And, um, and, I, and I was a ghostwriter there. So most of my, all my early publishing contacts, my agent and my publishers are all UK based. And now I've got American agents and, and the like, but um, but yeah, so that's where my publishing career sort of took off. But I moved the family back to Australia oh, about 20 years ago now, but I still set my books in the UK. Indeed you do. I love your ghostwriting career. I actually looked up some things about Michael today and I like the fact, here's what it says. In 1993, you quit journalism to become a ghostwriter, collaborating with politicians, pop stars, psychologists, adventurers, and show business personalities. 12 of these nonfiction titles were bestsellers with a combined sale of more than 2 million copies. And I'm pretty sure that you had to sign non-disclosure agreements. So we aren't going to know which ones you wrote. Yeah. Uh, I, could, I could tell you a few of them, but I'd have to kill you if I told uh, you others. Um, but um, I'm probably the best known for a UK, for a US audience. And I know we've probably got a global, bit of a global audience here, but I ghost wrote Jerry Hallowell's autobiography. Uh, as she was Ginger Spice and the Spice Girls. Um, and, and I was commissioned to write that just after she had, had fled the Spice Girls. And they were at that point the biggest band in the world. And, um, and the world seemed to want to answer the question why the band broken up. And, uh, and so I, um, I grudgingly initially agreed to do that book because I had a six and a three-year-old daughter and they had daughters and they were driving me nuts listening to nothing but Spice Girls music. And I thought, really, do I want to go down that, that road? Um, but no, it was an incredibly successful book, that one uh, around the world. Um, did, the, did the London Olympics and the, um, you know, the I think it was the closing ceremony where they featured so many British music groups and the Spice Girls, I remember, were part of it. Um, did that give a sort of added impetus to the whole thing, more of a global audience? No, it was more, I think, I mean, because that sort of came after, that they sort of reunited for that Olympic Games yeah. sort of ceremony. But back in sort of the, uh, I suppose, around 2000, when they were at their, um, were at the height of their fame, I'm trying to remember, my daughter was born in, my eldest daughter born in 1993. So probably about 2000. I mean, they were the biggest band in the world. I mean, but the generation now that are in their sort of late 20s, generation of, of people that are in their late 20s, the Spice Girls were the Beatles of their day. They were the biggest influence. Um, 
And I mean, my eldest child is now a, a songwriter producer uh, living in LA. And, um, and on the wall of the studio, there is Spice Girls paraphernalia signed, signed t-shirts by and shirts by Jerry because that's how influential Jerry was, um, Jerry Halliwell and the Spice Girls were um, um, for Alex. And, and, and that's one of the reasons that Alex became a producer songwriter. It's interesting how these bands break up at the sort of, we've been watching the um, Peter Jackson Beatles, you know, let it be. Um, the first, the middle one, I think, sags a bit, and we're saving up to watch the last two and a half hours Very for, the, good. for the big finale. But, you know, it's interesting to watch these personalities and how um, somehow they manage to fuse for the music, but individually mm -hmm. they're, you know, Ringo comes across as the most stable of them. And yeah. John is, you know, so doped up the whole time. You can see he's just <laughs> kind of in a trance. And Paul is really this driving force and George is kind of resentful and, you know, and you think um, what it must be like for them, you know, to all be sort of in a cluster. A lot of these bands break up like that. They have that dynamic. Yeah, I look, it's one of those things about, I mean, as a ghostwriter, I ghost wrote 15 autobiographies for very famous people. And one of the, one of, you know, they're all very different, but one of the things you realize is that People to be that successful often have very big, strong personalities, very alpha personalities. And if you, in a band situation, when you get that clash between, I mean, often you need that energy, that creative energy um, uh, and uh, conflict to actually push the band to the heights, but it's also the thing that ultimately will break them up. And, and the same thing happened in the Spice Girls. There were two, in particular in that band, there were two huge personalities that fought constantly, but they were also the two figures that drove that band to become, you know, um, the, at that point, the biggest band in the world when they were at their height. Makes you wonder what goes on with the Rolling Stones, which has somehow had at least two major personalities that have held together and miraculously have lived to be old. Considering yeah, yeah no, no, that's true. Although it's interesting. I, I, it makes you wonder oftentimes with them, though, I mean, how much time they spend with each other outside of touring and actually how much they like like each other or whether, you know, I mean, um, because with a lot of these people, a lot of these bands, they, they finish up not liking each other. They can still work together, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to almost be married to them. So we have, um, I, I guess the question would be, since you're this new book, which I really love, called When You Are Mine, it's our British Crime Book of the Month. And I'm, it's starting a new series. Am I right there? Well, it was supposed to be a standalone, Barbara, but the reaction to the book has been so um, tremendous. And everyone keeps saying to me, are we going to see Philomena McCarthy again, you know, the, the, the lead character? Uh, and, and so, um, yeah, there will be another Philomena book, not the next one, but maybe the one after there'll be a, another book featuring Philomena. Well, I certainly hope so, because there are actually a few threads in here that you can still pull. Um, so it'd be it'd be a shame, I think, to leave it as a as a standalone. Yeah. But you know, you you have written one long running series with Joe McLaughlin. Uh, tell us what's going on with Joe, because there's some interesting news that you've revealed recently. Yeah, no, they've uh, they've just finished shooting uh, in the UK, in London and Liverpool, um, a six part TV series um, being made by World Productions, who are a very successful UK company who who gave, uh, gave us shows like Line of Duty and The Bodyguard and The Bletchley Circle and some really big UK dramas. And um, they're shooting, they've shot the first novel was called The Suspect. They've, they've shot that the lead actor playing the Joe Lockman character is Aidan Turner, who is probably best known as the sexy um, dwarf in the Hobbit, the Hobbit movies. He was... Um, he was the one that always got his shirt off. And also um, Poldark in the remake of a, a very successful UK series called Poldark. He, uh, he plays the lead, Ross Poldark. And again, um, I have a feeling that he's far more handsome than I imagined Joe O'Loughlin would be. Uh, and I have a feeling they're probably going to write a scene in where he has to take his shirt off. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not? If you've got beefcake, you might as well exploit it. <laughs> but he's a, anyway, he's, a, it's, he's a very it's, good actor. He's a very yeah. good actor. Yeah. Now, I remember him very well from The Hobbit, 
Um, and also, as you pointed out, you know, I love the first pull dark. So I had a lot of trouble watching the second one. I there was something about the first one that was truly magical. Um, mm. So it's funny. Been... I, 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 I got to admit, I didn't watch the second second series. Um, but I did think when uh, when Aidan Turner was announced as being the Joe Lachlan character, I sort of thought, um, I, I sort of Googled him <laughs> and realised that um, that he's abs- he is beefcake, you're absolutely right. He's also a very fine actor, but he's got something like 300 fan sites on social media. He is, and he is just, I mean, tabloid fodder and, and, and women's magazine fodder, particularly in the UK and Europe. So it's the sort of thing that will generate enormous amounts of publicity for the show because um, he is just enormously sort of loved by the paparazzi and the general public. So um, hopefully that will mean we get a lot of eyeballs watching that series when it comes out and it'll be later this year. So as we often have to say as the Outlander bookstore, we don't actually have to say there are books. Um, for the people who, who watch it out there. I know Craig Johnson with the Longmire series, which as you know, has an Australian called Robert Taylor as the lead, that people were astonished uh, every once in a while, Craig would go somewhere and people would go, oh, there are books. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, how could that be? So is that, do you think, um, is that gonna pressure you to write more books for Joe? Are you done with Joe? Or are you still excited about Joe? What are you going to do with him in books? Well, I mean, I think, as you know, with the Joe, Joe Lachlan, you know, was a character, brilliant, you know, the brilliant psychologist with a crumbling body was sort of the, I gave him early onset Parkinson's in that first book, never intending to write him as a series. I mean, I'd be an idiot to have done that. Um, But he obviously, you know, he struck a chord and I've, I did seven or eight books with Joe. Right. Uh, But I aged him in real time and his disease progressively got worse. And so there was a limit to what I, I felt as though I could do with Joe. But saying that, when I left that series, um, his daughter, Charlie, had aged from the age of eight and was now at university studying psychology. So I've given myself a possibility of spinning the series on with her, taking a lead role in Joe, perhaps mentoring her. She was studying psychology. Um, And what I thought I might do, I mean, if the series is successful and they go on to make more, because the plan would be for for, for them to make, you know, the next book into a series as well, I thought uh, it might be fun maybe when the second series came out to, to do a new Joe Lachlan book. Um, by that stage, obviously, hopefully the character would be even better known because of the series and it might um, be just the time to say, you know, it'll, it will then have been about five or six years between the last book. So it'll be a bit of an event, hopefully. Well, we are certainly well placed to discuss the effect of television series on books and book sales. But, you know, thinking about Ian Rankin and Michael Connolly both did the same thing you did. You know, they mm-hmm. aged their characters in real time and they've come up with interesting solutions. Michael has created a female um, yep. and, you know, and so Bosch has now moved out of, you know, active duty and is mentoring Renee Ballard mm-hmm. as a policewoman. And Ian in his last book, you know, has. Well, he's brought along Siobhan and other people mm. all along. So, you know, I it's possible it. for you to do what it you're is. suggesting. And there also, yeah. Michael, there also is the possibility of prequels before mm. he was old and before he got sick. Yeah, I mean, there are, although I think one of the points with Joe was that he wasn't, I mean, Joe was always a reluctant investigator. He, was, he, he wasn't like working with the police. He was a normal psychologist. He got dragged into these things. Yeah. And in that first book, it's the first time he'd ever been involved in anything. So a prequel would be quite hard for him. But I always loved the, I know Ian Rankin quite well, and I love Ian's rationale because he retired, he retired um, uh, Rebus, John Rebus, because, you know, in, under Scottish law, detectives retired at the age of 60. And then, um, and, and this is a true story, the Scottish Parliament debated increasing the age to 65 and one of the reasons given was that it would mean that Ian could write more Rebus books which made a lot of detectives quite unhappy in Scotland because <laughs> they were I always love that story you know it's, it's really it's really wonderful I yeah. noticed in fact on the most recent Michael Connolly book it says a Renee Ballard and Harry Bush book 
So, you know, he's, he's done that. Yeah. So you have, you have lots of opportunities. Now, in your career, um, you have won an astonishing number of awards. We are eventually going to talk about this book, but this is all That's background stuff here. So um, it, this gives me a chance to, because we often have an international audience for, um, for authors like Michael, um, to talk about the, the major awards that uh, it's possible to win as a crime writer. So the first, since you started in the UK, the, the first ones would be The Gold Dagger. You've won it twice. And in fact, the book we last talked about was the one that won The Gold Dagger, right? Um, possibly. Or was it the book before? It was Good Girl, Bad Girl won the, um, yeah. So the two that have won the daggers were Life, Life and Death, um, and then Good Girl, Bad Girl won it about two or three years ago. Um, um, no, actually, it won it in 2020, right? Oh, did it? There you go. Oh, it did. So um, <laughs> I, I think that was our last conversation, and then you oh, went yeah, on to right. the Gall Dagger. Um, but you've also been um, shortlisted. I'm trying to remember. Yep, you've been shortlisted for the Steel Dagger, which is the best thriller, as opposed yeah, I won, to. Like and I won the Steel Dagger um, last year with. Um, uh, when she was good which is the follow-up to good girl bad girl um i haven't managed i've been twice i've been shortlisted for an edgar which is obviously the big you know i mean the two big from into my mind the two big crime awards anywhere in the world are the gold daggers and the edgars um best novel awards uh, they're the absolute pinnacle and um as i said i've managed to win the gold dagger twice but i've been shortlisted twice for an edgar um and not never quite managed to get there but i'm going to keep trying well, I'm delighted to hear that. Actually, one of the books you were shortlisted for the Steel Dagger for was The Night Fairy, which remains one of my all-time favorite of your books. It has such a killer surprise in it. Lord, I still remember how amazed I was. It was absolutely fabulous. But since you're in Australia, let's remind everybody there is something called the Ned Kelly Award uh, for Best Novel, and that's a um, also um, in crime fiction, and you've won that twice, as I understand it. I have, yeah. I've won that twice. It's so you're almost a trifecta. You just got to win an Edgar and then you will Yeah, be... I think the thing with the Ned Kelly Awards, though, which is a wonderful award, but that's only eligible. You've got to be an Australian to sort of win that. Where the difference with the two big awards, the Edgars and um, and the Daggers, is that it's for, it doesn't matter what nationality you are, it's just for what they regard as being the best crime novel of the year. It's not as like a, a little national award which is in no way does that downplay Nanette Kelly's. I love that. I was chairman of the Australian Crime Writers Association for about seven years and I ran those awards, which is why for seven years I never put my books forward for those awards because it was, wasn't the right thing to do if you're part of the organisation. But I think it's, um, I love those awards and I love supporting new crime writers. Well, I think you've been very generous to other writers and you know, it's, um, I think it's a hallmark actually of a, of a, not just a good writer, but a really nice guy, a good father, good, good husband, whatever it is that you are generous to other people. Maybe now we'll actually talk about this book that you tuned in to watch today. So when you were mine introduces a new character named Philomena, Philomena McCarthy. Um, and she's, she's a police woman. So tell me about the, um, the fancy unit that she is part of in London. And you... does it relate to Line of Duty at all? Yeah. Um, no, I must admit, I love that series, Line of Duty, but it's got that element. I mean, I'll give you the pitch, I suppose. Philomena McCarthy is a very young, ambitious, very new uh, London police officer with the London Metropolitan Police, which is sort of like the New York City Police, but in London. Um, and she's had to defy the odds, really, to become a policewoman because she's from a family of gangsters or mobsters. I mean, her, the legendary McCarthy brothers have spent, you know, her father and three uncles, uh, you know, three of the four have spent a long time in prison. Uh, so she's had to completely distance herself from her family to be allowed to join the London Metropolitan Police. But it always hangs in the background. And her family, her father in particular, she's an only child, would love to be able to draw her back into the fold. Um, and so that's a sort of family dynamic. She's engaged to be married. She rescues uh, a young woman from a domestic violence incident where this badly beaten young woman, uh, and this woman has been beaten up by um, someone who turns out to be a decorated London detective. 
and I guess that's the seed of this story. And um, and, and the I guess the idea for the novel came from uh, a documentary I saw on exactly that subject, that how the police fail to investigate their own when it comes to domestic abuse, how often it's covered up, not investigated when it, when the abuse involves a police officer having having beaten up or abused their partner. And I suddenly thought to myself, is there more, is there a, a situation where you would be more helpless? Because the very people you would normally turn to to help would be the police if you were being abused. And not only do they not help you, but because your partner has access to all of those wonderful computers and technology, your partner would know where the women's shelters are. He would know how to track your car. He would know how to find your phone. That you, there's no way you could hide. There's no and and it's hard enough already if you're um, a survivor of domestic abuse to 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 stay clear of violent partners. But if your partner is a police officer, it becomes almost impossible. And so that is sort of the setup that I wanted to create in this book. Well, there's an additional problem because he's not just a police officer. He's a theoretically heroic police officer, which means that not only do they protect their own, but they really don't want this legend, um, you know, to be tarnished in any way. So even if they, there's a real motive for a cover up by, by the police um, in the sense, you know, they have something to lose. They have a stake yeah. in it too, I guess is what I want to say. Yeah. yeah and, and it's an interesting, I mean, occasionally it happens and it's a trait where you write a book and then something happens in real life which um, mirrors what you've written if you know what I mean it's not something that you didn't write it after the event you wrote it before in the case of of this book um, there was a terrible murder that happened after the book was finished a, a woman called Sarah Everhard was picked up uh, walking home by a policeman by a police officer and murdered and um and in the in the scandal that followed, it, it came out that there were there are many opportunities for the police to have identified this man as being a predator, and to have got kicked him out of the force, and to uh, and that failed to happen. And it's sort of, I think one of the reasons the book has struck struck such a chord in the UK in particular was because it came out just at about the same time that the Sarah Everhard was was murdered and uh it's again it's a tragedy where but occasionally as a crime writer you're you end up mirroring um events that happen well you do and you know there's there's no way you can time a book it takes so long for a book to be written and go through a production process and finally publish there's no way you can write towards anything like that so no, it can only happen as you say that by chance you publish a book and, yeah. and it mirrors real life in, in some way. I've seen yeah. it happen so often over the years. Although, to be fair, you know, occasionally, Michael, you can see an event and you say to yourself, somebody is going to write about this. An example of that would be the great flood that hit Chicago years ago. And I can remember in the aftermath of all the coverage and so forth, saying to myself, Sarah Peretsky is going to write this. Yeah, it's interesting. Well, it's funny. I, I remember thinking the same thing with... Um uh tin roof blowdown james lee burke and and the yeah. you know um you know hurricane katrina and and thinking i remember thinking not necessarily that it would be james lee burke but i thought someone is going to write um a, a, a crime novel and probably many novels fiction would much would be written set around i mean that backdrop and i guess we all we're all looking even if we tell very small personal stories we all I mean if you have a big dramatic backdrop in which to to tell a story uh, it gives it enormous sort of play with the reader. Well as you point out you, your book mirrored something because of the you know the confluence of time which is different than if you use this uh, an historical event mm. as a springboard yeah. you know yeah. to write something uh, the immediacy I think and lends a big punch. Um, yeah to when people read it and you know people who don't know about the whole publishing process I think often wonder if it's more like journalism than it is <laughs> yeah fiction. no it's true and that's why you know in the past I know when I had a book I think it was um when Say Your Sorry came out um and it had been out for quite a while when uh, there was a terrible um story well it, 
uplifting in the sense that several women that had been held captive for 10 years uh, managed to break free from where they were held. And, um, and I remember getting all this, I mean, remember someone being attacked on social media that I had cashed in on that, on that by writing a novel on a similar sort of subject. And my novel was written three years before they ever emerged. I had, you know, and, but again, it's just in the reader's mind, they can, they don't realize how long these things take. And you're not in any way would a crime writer cash in on anything. It's just uh, sometimes you write something that happens to be mirrored in real life, you know, and it's an well, one, of, one of the gifts that you have as a novelist um, is writing characters, but oftentimes they turn out to be more surprising than we think they are. And unfortunately, we can't talk about all of the characters in this book because then the dreaded word spoiler comes into play. But I do think anybody who reads your books needs to be careful in assumptions about the characters that you're writing. So I guess a really interesting question would be, when you conceive them, do you think of them as, you know, with all those possibilities or do they develop for them as you write them? Um, oh, they develop as I write them. It's interesting because apart from, I guess, the other, what you're alluding to is the other great theme of, of when you were mine. Obviously, domestic abuse is a hot button issue around the world. And so that's one theme. And police corruption and cover ups, another. The other one is toxic friendships, this idea. And we've all had them, this idea that you befriend someone who just suddenly is incredibly helpful. And then this is, in this case, is that coming too much away? The Tempe Brown character, the woman that is rescued by Philomena uh, from the domestic violence incident, they befriend, they become great friends and, and Tempe begins to arrange, help Phil arrange a wedding and, but there's something not quite right because Tempe, I mean, just clings and it just becomes, you know, it's almost like where you suddenly as a reader, as you're reading, you're thinking, run Phil, because <laughs> you're sensing that there's something not quite right about, you know, um, but, you know, on the one hand, you know, when you think having a friend that picks up all your dry cleaning for you and does all your chores for you, and does, you think, how oh, well, wouldn't it be great to have someone like that? And another little part of you is thinking, no, they're getting a little bit too close here. And, uh, and so that's something I wanted to investigate in the book as well. Do you think that, that women are more likely to have these kinds of friendships? You know, they're, in various British novels, you can find out that those kinds of things are with a, a personal assistant or you know for men mm -hmm. oftentimes it's a personal assistant or yeah. you know a servant in the household or something that the male thing doesn't seem to be friendship so much as it does you know a person in yeah. charge and then the person underneath them so yeah or, or you get i guess it's, it's a reflection and obviously there are some very famous films on um that idea of with men, it's normally a relationship. It's like that. It's the it's the fatal attraction type story where you know the man has the one night stand, and it's the the one night stand thinks it's more than a one night stand. It's that, and like men are obviously, and men and women are both. I mean, this whole idea of the stalking, you know, I mean, this idea of people stalking a partner or an ex partner or even just someone that they become infatuated with, a famous person. I mean that you, you have those elements as well. Uh, but I think with friendships, it is more women. I think with relationships, it can be often involve, um, when men are involved, it's more potentially that there's been a relationship and it's either broken down or, or, um, or someone wants more than the other person from the relationship. Um, I do know when I was writing When You Were Mine, I wanted to create it has a sort of, but this is not giving too much away, but it has that sort of ending, that morally ambiguous ending where you debate afterwards whether you think who you think was right or wrong. And, and there are sort of, I wanted to sort of, there are endings of books like um, uh, Mystic River by Dennis Lehane with certain events in Mystic River and also Presumed Innocent by Scott mm -hmm. Thoreau, where when you get to the ending, you sort of think, did the real, you know, who, who was the real bad person there? Did the right person get suffer or yeah, that morally, I wanted, I wanted to have an ending where people would go, wow, I really want to talk to someone about that ending. <laughs> and we can't, but. 
No, we can't. But actually, I did have a, a we launched Scott Turow's last book. And one of the things we talked about was presume innocent. And I told him that I can remember people would stand at the checkout counter back in the days when I actually was the checkout counter at the poison pen for it got a little bigger than that and would argue about, you know, who, who did it. And I said to Scott, you know, we think of Gone Girl as, you know, as the, the kickoff for the trust no one genre and all, but actually presumed innocent was, oh, I agree. was I mean, really that book. Yeah, that un that idea of, you know, I think Scott Thoreau created that, did that unreliable narrator brilliantly. Oh. And that to me was the was he was the one that really showed how powerful it could be. As you say, later with books like Gone Girl or Girl on a Train, it's been used a lot of late, uh, probably over the last sort of five to 10 years. It, but, but to me, I'm presumed innocent is still one of the finest examples because I remember getting halfway through that book and thinking, oh my God, he yes. must have done it. He must have done it. He must, you know, and thinking, how can he narrate this and be the killer? How can he do that? Yeah, you know, it's brilliantly done. Well, I could take you all the way back to what is really the first one that I have ever read. I will take you back to Cyril Hare in A Tragedy of Law, because that was, in fact, the first unreliable narrator that I can recall. And that was written in the 1930s, way before. Yeah, I, haven't, I haven't read that. I'll have to go. Oh, and Michael, it's one of the really great books, honestly. <laughs> He was an Oxford Don who wrote, you know, he was another one. Of the, no, he was the sitting judge. That's right. He was the sitting judge. And, you know, he was still, I love this. He was still writing circuit in the 1930s, preceded by trumpeters. Wow. wow. Yeah, but it's a man. Francis Pettigrew is the name of the main character. But if okay. you've never read A Tragedy so at Law, I cannot recommend it to you highly enough. He keeps turning up in classics. And in fact, one of the great things about, um, about the pandemic is that it's really encouraged people to read classics. I mean, mm. there, there is an astonishing audience. Every week when I do the restock report at the bookstore, I am blown away by the vast number of classics that we sold in the past week, not just in crime, but you yeah. know, all kinds of, of stuff. And so we've really, we've now expanded to this big classic section that previously might've just been like one little bookshelf. Uh, you know, Martin Edwards has done a great job with the British Library crime classics, reminding people, uh, not not the, you know, pinnacle like Christie and Sayers and Allingham, but mm. a lot of really fine writers who wrote in that in that period. And I love it because there, there are so many wonderful conventions and structures for crime fiction, and you can really appreciate modern writers playing with it if you've read the originals. Yeah. You know, and then there were none. The Agatha Christie's had this huge rebirth, you know, of people using right. that design. And um, and it's more fun if you actually ever read. And then there were none, despite it. Yeah, original. it's funny. It's, it's, it, I was once famously um, misquoted, I should say. When, I, when I, my first novel, The Suspect, came out, I was interviewed and the headline in the story afterward was I was a crime writer who had only ever read one crime novel. Um, and what I'd sort of said at the time was unlike, I mean, you've interviewed so many people that would have talked that talk about being absolutely schooled in the genre. They grew up reading crime, they read crime, you know, under the covers by torchlight. And um, I wasn't like that at all. I mean, when I said I, I'd read more than one, but I'd sort of read one Agatha Christie and one Conan Doyle and one Ian Rankin. And and um, but I what because as a reader, um, you know, and when I wrote that first book, I didn't know it was a crime novel. So one of the reasons um, I still, to this day, I've read a lot more now, I sort of think I, I, I don't read as many as other people is because I'm scared of being influenced by them. And on the one hand, you're right, people should be influenced by them because there's some great writers of the past. But another part of me is, I know if I read too much James Lee Burke, I, I, I begin trying to write like a really poor man's version of James Lee Burke. And I think, OK, let's not read any more James Lee Burke while I'm writing. <laughs> well, I think we have to distinguish here between readers and writers. You know, yes. Readers can't afford to indulge yes. themselves. And I'm glad you mentioned Christie, because in that progression with the tragedy, a lot of presumed innocent, I should have put in the murder of Roger Ackroyd, right? Yeah, yeah which is yep. very, yeah. There Definitely. we are. So talk to me a little bit about names because you have, you know, you've got interesting names in this book. Philomena's not your garden variety name. T. 
Tempe Brown is an interesting name. Even the decorated cop, who is a real shit, I might say. Um, what's his Darren, name? Darren? Darren Goodall, is it? No. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, do you put a lot of energy into, into names coming up with, with the right name for the character or what you feel is the right name for the character? Yeah, look, I, I've got to, it, it has to feel right. I mean, I do love, I've always loved, and, and you can sort of see it with the, when I name my children, I, I love, I love girls' names that can be shortened to boys' names, like in terms of, um, you know, Charlotte gets Charlie or Philomena gets Phil, you know, um, and I don't know why that is, but I just, I just have that, I just like that, and you know, Fred, Frederica gets Fred or whatever, um, and, uh, but I guess what I'm looking for is I'm just looking for a name. And I, maybe this is a fallback to uh, having read a lot of Scandinavian or Nordic crime, where sometimes when the names are so unpronounceable, I find it really hard to remember them. Do you know what I mean? I find it really. And so you want a name that's memorable. And but also not a name that's so unusual that people um, struggle to actually, you know, uh, you know, when when they're trying to tell a friend about this book, it's got this character, and they think, well, I can't pronounce their name, but this. You know, um, so yeah, I, that, I just look for that. But you're right about they live and breathe in your mind because I, I remember very early on in my career, I was pointed out by an editor that I had too many names starting with J. Like every character seemed to have a name it was either Joe or Jock or Julianne or like there's just J's, and they said you have to change, you should change them, there's too many J's. And I really couldn't, because by that point, these characters were their name. And I couldn't just blithely give them a new one. It just didn't work in my head. <laughs> well, you do have to be careful in any one novel that you don't have like two, two people named James, or, you know, yeah. um, because yeah. otherwise the reader's never going to remember who it yeah. is that's speaking or yeah. the rest of it. Yeah. But yeah, I suppose in a universe of books that you could have, you know, J yeah. name. Or, and then, you know, we all have freighted, I don't know why, but I think each one of us has names that have some sort of, of association that, that makes the name unpleasant for us. I mean, I won't. Oh, speak. that's true. I yeah. won't speak out on a couple of mine, but you know, there's a sort of automatic aversion, you know, if I run across a character in a novel with this particular name. Yeah. And then, you know, recently we have these stupid tropes like, you know, Karen has, uh, you know, become oh, kind of great. a buzzword. And, you know, I think that's a shame to appropriate a perfectly nice name and turn it into yeah. something. Sort of but it's like, but it's like, you know, when, I, when I, my children were being born, you know, there's a name that, you know, we're discussing names and suddenly, you know, my wife will mention a name and I go, oh, no, I had a really terrible girlfriend who was called that. <laughs> so we always associate people with um, with that, you know. I mean, I auction I auction names normally one a book for charity. And I know when Joe Lockman books were, what a lot of writers do, as you know, and uh, with the Joe Lockman books, it, Parkinson was the chat, Parkinson's charity sort of always. And, uh, and when you do that, you just sit there and have everything, all your fingers crossed saying that, please, 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 please don't have a name like Ronald Reagan or, or like Michael Jackson. You, you, you don't want them having a name that's incredibly, you know, common or famous. And then you don't want them having a name that's completely unpronounceable. And so you're just sort of going, please, please give me a good name. <laughs> I can see that. Now, does the character come to life for you? when you when you assign them a name i mean you know which which goes first do you think of a character and then come up with a name or do you find a name and then that sort of begins um, to sketch the character for you the voice comes first i mean I, I write as you know a lot on the first person and to me and i ghost wrote obviously in the first person when i was when i wrote books for people like jerry hallowell you know all i did lulu the 60s pop star lulu um they've got unique voices. So when you write their, their autobiography, you have to sound like them. You have to recreate their voice. And when I write fiction, it's the same. And I remember when I first wrote Joe O'Loughlin, um, you know, and I gave him early on Snap Parkinson's, I can remember the moment I captured his voice. I wrote a paragraph where Joe says, um, when, I, when I get out of bed every morning, I know if it's going to be a good day or a bad day if I can bend down and tie my shoes. And I just thought that's his voice, that slightly self-deprecating sense of 
that's his voice. And once I had his voice, that's what makes the character come to life. To a sense, I could call them anything after that, but as long as I have their voice in my head and I, and I think I'm inside their head, that's what comes first. Well, Joe's, a, you know, Joe's a good name. It's kind of an ordinary Joe, as we would yeah. say, you know, um, but Philomena is not an ordinary name. So, you know, it made me wonder if you wanted to, you know, that you saw her as extraordinary, you want her to be extraordinary, yeah. and the name is part of that whole personality. Yeah, I mean, I, I do want it to be, I mean, I, you know, I don't, I'm not a huge lover of, of slogans, but I, if I had sort of three words that I put above my desk, it would be make them care in terms of so. And what I mean by that is that I want to create a character that the reader cares about and wants to go on this journey with. And with Philomena, it's, um, it's a memorable name. And I just, but I think it's more a case of, you can have a memorable name, but if you don't make a mem her memorable as a character, if you don't give her a wonderful sense of humanity or humor or you know um then people won't won't want to go i mean i i mean or talking about going back to something like unreliable narrators i mean i'm in awe of gillian flynn with you know gone girl because neither of the two main characters in that amy or nick are likable i mean you dislike them both and yet it's one of the most compelling compelling books you'll ever read uh, and that takes a really genius piece of writing in my case i think I need to create a character that people fall in love with and want to be. And then even the most horrible thing that happens, they're there with them. They're saying, please, please, you must endure. You must get through this. I find it difficult. There are very few books that I really bond with if there's not one person in it to like. Exactly. Um, and, you know, one of the things I don't really like about this whole trust no one wave that I keep hoping is receding is that very often that's what you wind up getting. Um, is, you know, a whole series of unlikable characters and it's hard to, to root for them. But then some of the most successful books that we know um, are, are like that. So, yeah. and you know. no, you're right. I mean, when you look at, um, I mean, I think again, Patricia Highsmith, you know, Ripley yeah. is one of the classic examples of, you know, psychopath and yet where they're wanting Ripley to get away with it. You know, it's a, sure. it's a genius piece of writing. But, and look, there are certain shows like most recently White Lotus, which I don't know whether you've seen the, the series White Lotus, mm. um, but there's not a single character in that that is in any way likable. And yet it is compelling watching. Succession, another very big series of, of late on TV, right. um, of streaming. Again, all of them are loathsome people, but... I think it, it, a good enough writer can make it work, perhaps. Um, I don't know if I'm there, uh, but I, I think I've got to make my characters. There's got to be someone in it that you want to root for and, and, and to, to win. Well, if you're a reader, you want different experiences and different kinds of books. You don't want to read, well, that's true of me anyway. I shouldn't say if you're a reader, but um, because some people like to read the same book, same sort of book over and over again, but... I like the, the different experiences. Talk to me just a little bit about structure before we summon up Patrick for questions. Most of your books have really been investigatory in their, you know, police procedurals by their very nature are, but even Joe. Um, yeah, they're not that way. Yeah, they're not. It's funny, I, I, I avoid I, it very rarely. I actually don't call them police procedures because mainly I've never had a policeman, or I think only once have I had a policeman as the main character. Vincent Ruiz did a book where he was at the, you know, and I think Mike, this is what sort of Michael Connolly discovered at times, that if you, if, you put, if you put your character in the middle of the police force, then there are great rules and regulations about investigating. In the UK, it's called the Police and Criminal Evidence Act about what you can and can't do, you know, um, you know, whereas, you know, and, you know, of course you can take, you can have your road policeman that, you know, decides to, you know, I'm going to kick down that door. I'm not going to wait for the warrant type thing. But normally there's great strictures on, on the police, whereas having a psychologist as your main character um, made it much sort of easier to operate outside that, that, that sphere. Philomena is interesting because even though she is a policewoman, it's not an investigation as such. She's actually just independently trying to protect, uh, pr to protect Tempe and protect herself. Um, and, you know, off the books, she's investigating this corrupt, this, this violent police officer trying to see if there's some way, because he's trying to destroy her career and she's trying to save her career. And it's sort of, 
So it's not, you wouldn't say it's a classic police procedural. There's not a crime that she's trying to, some killer um, out there that she's trying to. No, but it, it still has a structure that moves, you know, yeah. along, with, um, I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think. There's a me, mission involved, you know, yeah. which is. Oh, no, it's really... also, I mean, very much. I mean, I, you know, that classic, it's got that classic story, storytelling. I mean, it, all great story needs conflict, but it also needs someone must want something and something has to stand in their way right. and so it's got all of those drivers there and and I mean structurally with me and this is a book that's sort of an example of, I don't plot the books in advance so I have no idea how the book's going to end when I begin and um and sometimes I think that shows because the book sort of sometimes drifts onto places you don't know where it's going to go um uh and that's because that's where my mind took me <laughs> and, um as long as i can drag it back um you know that's uh, and i do i remember when i was writing when you were mine getting to a point thinking i don't know how to end this book i don't know i don't know how you know i don't know how it's going to end and and uh and you know panicking that i was for the first time i was going to not come up with an ending um but in the end i was really happy because i think i came up with an ending that most people won't see they won't see coming. I liked your ending very much, but I also think, you know, the fact that you trained as a journalist and you wrote, you know, you did your ghostwriting and all gives you a platform and a confidence that, you know, journalism training, I think, is a huge help in mm. writing, in writing, especially crime novels, because, you know, you're trained to, you're trained to think along the lines of, you know, how, how does the story go? You know, yeah. here's where it starts. Well, I think, and yeah. How do and we, we how do we get to where we're going? Yeah, and we're good at meeting deadlines. And I think, um, I mean, it's true. It's a lot of uh, most journalists that I worked with in my career wanted to be writers. Um, a lot of them did. A lot of you know, and like people like Michael Connolly is a former journalist. Obviously, I mean, so many, so many. Um, Laura Lipman, you know, I mean, there are so many that came out of journalism, um, uh, but a lot. Also, a lot that don't, because a lot of a lot of those journalists discover that there's a great energy in writing a different story every day as a journalist, and and the thought of sitting down for twelve months and working on a single project is something they just couldn't couldn't sort of focus on. Um, they have to be doing something new and different and exciting all the time. Um, and so, on the one hand, you're absolutely right. Journalism is a tremendous career to come out of to become a crime writer. Uh, but on the other hand, it takes a lot of discipline to sit down um, and work on a single project and it not does. be distracted. Absolutely. And, but I also think journalists are receptive to editing because they've been edited. And, you know, part of that process does involve yeah. editing. Yeah. And let me see, Patrick, do come and join us. But I did want to say that, you know, in, re in regard to your comment about police procedurals and how they have to work within the confines of what cops are allowed to do. I've often thought that's one reason why private eye novels are so fabulous because, yes. you know, they, they get to behave. Um, yeah, they're like outside. Police, but not like, you know, we, we've just been watching the CB strike, the, um, the JK Rowling writing yeah. as Robert Galbraith. And, you know, he's an interesting character. Mm. He's different than the guy in the book in many ways, but um, you know, they can break bounds and, and do yeah. things that, um, that you can't and do I, as a cop. You can't take yeah. your credit card and, you know, break into the... Yeah. the, the no, it's true. You know? It's true. And that's why a lot of people, and even, I mean, Michael Connolly did it with Bosch at times, right. you know, had him, had him out of the police force, had him thrown out so he could actually do a few novels with Bosch not having those restrictions. Right. Um, and, and your psychologist uh, is not that different than a than a, than a private eye. I mean, he has a particular expertise and he also has a client, which is why, you know, that it's almost like the classic, classic Western structure, you know, where does your loyalty lie? And with a private eye, in theory, it's it's really to your client. Patrick, are you there or have I discouraged you from popping in by- Maybe there are, maybe there are no questions. <laughs> there no, I'm here. I was waiting for the opportune moment. All right. Um, there is a question, you, you've discussed this a little bit, but, um, uh, Geraldine wants to know, can you tell us uh, more about your time as a police reporter? I have a feeling I know who this Geraldine might be. Um, <laughs> it may be, I might be wrong, it might be the wonderful Geraldine Brooks, who is an incredibly fine novelist. Um, uh, I, I, began, um, I began my journalism career as a, uh, as a cadet on an uh, a, a Australian newspaper. And, um, and 
I part of that was as a police rounds person. That's where you listen to police ambulance and fire radios. And this goes back to what you were saying, Barbara, about journalists having a background where they have a lot of information at their fingertips, because um, that was pretty much the paper I worked for. The bread and butter stories that that paper um, that that paper survived on were court stories and police rounds. So it was a lot of chasing of police cars, ambulances and fire engines. And we monitored the frequencies of all of the, those um, services. And often we would, we would jump in a car and turn up and go to the, these scenes. And, and there are times when I've been to crime scenes before and got there before the police, because we were, we were closer than they were. And, um, you know, which, you know, I saw, you see a lot of tragedy, you see, um, you know, it's, uh, you see a lot of, um, grief uh and it's one of the things i think i it was it was one i i can remember the moment where i'm i think I, I spent most of my early career when i was doing police rounds um uh almost imagining that this was just a drama in front of me that it wasn't that wasn't a real person that was in that wrecked car or that wasn't a real person that had jumped off that cliff or and it was only about four years in that I went to an accident scene where uh, uh, a man was pinned in into a truck by an accident and he was talking to me. Um, they were waiting for the jaws of life to be able to move the metal to be able to pull him out. And I was moved away by a fire officer to Tom to, to move back from the scene and that truck burst into flames and he and that driver who uh, perished in the truck. And because I talked to him, because I had, he talked about, oh, my wife's going to kill me. I'm going to be late home tonight. You know, I, I'd, I'd made that connection. I remember being completely traumatized by, by, by that event because for the first time I suddenly, you know, I, I couldn't just say that this was sort of happened, like this was drama. This wasn't real. These were real people. And um, yeah, and no, but I, I, so much of what I write is informed by my career as a journalist. And, and when it comes to police rounds, um, you know, particularly working nights, the only people you, you're, you're hanging out with detectives who are working nights and with the pimps and the prostitutes and the drug dealers and the druggies and day other people that you uh, tend to, to spending a lot of your time with. And I learned a, a, a tremendous amount and saw a lot of life. If that actually is Geraldine Brooks, can I give a shout out and say how <laughs> happy was the writer? I think you are. And we've really enjoyed selling your books. And once upon a time, you actually signed one of your books for us, which I've always been grateful for. Absolutely. And if you're not that Geraldine Brooks, I know. thank if you for saying Geraldine. something anyway. Um, yeah, another question from uh, my good friend, Stefan Vlahovic. Um, he wants to know any thoughts of, of work set in Australia? Yeah, I get asked this question a lot because obviously being Australian and um, I mean, a lot of people in Australia for many years thought I was English and uh, would ask me, I'd turn up at events and they'd say, how long are you here for? Imagining that I was sort of heading back to heading back to London at any moment. Um, uh, and look, I will. I mean, I have, uh, <laughs> I love telling the story that in my, in my bottom drawer, I have the greatest ever unpublished Australian novel. Uh, and um, it was a book that I wrote in 1985. And it was almost published by Penguin in the UK. And it missed out by a single vote in a publishing meeting. Um, and I asked afterwards, why, you know, why didn't you publish it? And they said, well, if you had set that story in England, Ireland, Scotland or Wales, because this was a book set in Australia, so we would have published it in a heartbeat. But because you set it in Australia, it's just too hard for us to try to to sell and I mean the world's moved on a lot since 1985 as we know I mean where people are reading books set all over the world but that was at an era where pretty much the, the Brits was, would read British crime and the Americans would read American crime and you didn't get much sort of crossover or international fiction and um and so that book is still in my bottom drawer and now I obviously get asked by publishers all the time to pull, pull it out but and 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 maybe I will one day. Although while it remains in my bottom drawer, it will it will still be the Australian's greatest ever unpublished novel. Um, but the moment I take it out, then clearly that's going to end. <laughs> Is that your first novel, Michael? 
that is my first novel yeah wow. and um and so uh i look but i do I, i'm waiting for the idea really i'm waiting you know and it may well be that's the book that i i, I rewrite i mean because i wrote it when i was sort of 25 so it's a lot of years ago um it may well be that one that i that i rewrite um but i'm waiting for the idea really um i'm waiting for the idea that i think it would be perfect um to for, for an australian setting let's see anything else there are a couple of questions that have come in in a looks to be russian language that i can't translate <laughs> but um, i won't guess what they are but uh let's see that's about it barbara it's a well why, why group. if i'm not squelching anybody let me say that one of the great things i have found over the last couple of years with zoom is that we've been able to connect with authors all over the world. The most challenging, Michael, you'll, you'll appreciate this, is that I conceived the idea of putting two Irish authors together, completely forgetting the fact that one lived in Dublin, I'm in Scottsdale, and the other lives in Perth. And oh. to try to work out the time zones for that one was really, um, really challenging. But, you know, we've been, we've been all over. We've been, we've been in Sweden, we've been in France, we've been all over Australia, New Zealand. Uh, we're doing an event for the First Lady of Iceland on February 19th, uh, which, you know, none of these opportunities really would have been ours uh, without, without Zoom. And I think that as a result, there's a lot more interest, at least in our customers, in international crime. But even without that and before then, and maybe the Scandinavian thing really kicked it off, but I'm finding more and more books published in the United States are actually written um, by authors in other countries and people really like them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think Australian crime is actually making serious headwind into-, yeah. into No, US I think, leaders. I mean, I think we, you know, we talk sort of outback noir, um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, no, I think, I mean, we'd all, I think in Australia, as I said, being involved in the Crime Rights Association for so long, we're, we were all sort of hoping that the next wave wouldn't, after Nordic noir would be sort of outback noir or um, uh, antipodean noir. But um, no, you're right. I think the beauty is that readers, and, and now, I mean, that's the beauty of being a reader. You can be transported into any part of the world. And um, and it's, uh, it's, it's what has sort of meant that, you know, I know from at my point of view in Australia, I someone like Jane Harper. I mean, I was told about it's sad. This was a sad thing. About ten years ago, I was told by a very senior international publisher that they would be happy if I wrote a book set anywhere in the world except Australia, because they said there was no Australian crime novel in modern times that had ever had really big international success. And I remember saying at the time, yes, but that that is until there is one. Right. And of course, Jane Harper of the Dry had such a massive international hit with that book and just proved that he was wrong. And now I think there's a lot of Australian writers now who are, uh, are making great inroads overseas. And, and, and Absolutely. So, yeah, I published one, as you know, Sir Larry Gentle, who I think yes, writes it was fabulous yeah. books. And, you know, I'm really excited. We've talked to Jane recently this year. In fact, Sir Larry and I are doing a conversation on January 18th. Um, you know, and hers are not out back at all. I mean, hers are. Yeah, you know. So it is. It's absolutely wonderful. Well, thank you, Michael, for sharing time. You're, you've always been one of my favorite writers, and I wish that we had gotten to see you in the flesh more frequently. Next time. And well, I now, as I said, I now have a child um, uh, who lives in, um, you know, full time in, in America. So I'm going to have to get across there um, more often. And uh, next time we'll have to do it in person at Boys and Pen. Well, I certainly hope you were. I'll talk to Sydney about it. We actually have a nonprofit arm of the Poison Pin, which um, we collect money from readers. And also I do some freelance editing and I put all my editor's fees into it and so forth. And part of it, I think we may end up using to for a plane fare for you know international writers who might not otherwise be able to come to the States, but can come here. And since we have this great platform that so many thousands of people watch, you know, one appearance yeah. of the Poison Pen could equal basically a book yeah. tour. Oh, I know, um, I'd love it. I mean, uh, as I say, well, I'm, I tend to be back and I'm sure I'll be there anyway at some point um, because, you know, as I say, 
family. You've got to, I mean, we had not seen Alex for two years and, um, and Alex came home for Christmas. So, but we will get to, we'll get back to America soon. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Michael. It's always a treat. Thank you. Um, thank you, Barbara. We, thank you, Patrick. Let me just remind you how wonderful this book is, When You Are Mine. Um, and don't be discouraged by the fact that our website says we're sold out because I'm going to fix that tomorrow. Um, we will have more copies. So thank you all very much for joining us. If you have a chance, stick around till for about a half hour, and we're going to talk to a debut novelist, and he's writing about an Irish character in World War II. And that's an aspect of the war. I don't know that we, you know, we read about German, we read about American, we read about British and all, but I don't know that we've read a lot of stories where the Irish are, you know, involved so much in the war. So Patrick being our resident Celt is going to be, <laughs> I hope, the engine of this program, but we'll see how Excellent. it goes. Right. Well, enjoy the rest of your day, Michael. And yeah, thank you. Night. Have a great enjoy. evening, guys. Enjoy thank everybody. You. Good night. Bye. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.